You're listening to Accounted For, the Canadian podcast that explores the intangibles of every career. I'm your host, Daniel Lee. Hello, hello. Welcome back to Accounted For, ladies and gentlemen. This is the podcast on a mission to expand your perspectives, question the status quo, and get you inspired to action for your own career. Please excuse my horribly sounding voice. I've just been terribly sick uh, the past week and I even had to really wait until it got a little better until I uh, recorded this intro. So that's also why I think the podcast episode is going to go out a little later on the Wednesday and not in the morning like I usually do. Um, But alas, (laughs) just wanted to be there for you all. Today's episode is a little different, you might have noticed from the title, but it is a replay from the past, a blast from the past, as you may call it. I'm currently on my own quarterly retreat, so I try to take two weeks off every quarter. It's a new thing I'm doing to uh, re-energize myself and re-strategize, and also if I get sick, it's best to get sick during this period, so it's not too bad. But... I looked through the past archives and wanted to replay one of the more popular episodes um, because I felt that this one, this particular episode, uh, I recorded it pretty early in the podcast's own journey. And for a lot of the newer listeners, they might not really have had a chance to hear it, but it was one of the very fascinating interviews I had done. So I figured this could benefit all the new listeners. And for the old ones, it will still be a really fun story. So I really hope you enjoy this podcast episode, and I hope to get back to you with a better voice in the near future. All right. Thank you and enjoy. Today's guest is Armin Yasai. Armin is one of the co-owners of a local Toronto coffee shop called Moss Moss. And honestly, this was a great interview. I really was excited all throughout you could probably hear it in my voice as i just could not contain my excitement at certain points because i had this little dream of mine of owning a coffee shop and talking to someone who was an accountant and decided to go operate a coffee shop and not just one but currently three locations with potentially more coming online it was just an exciting time and we go through everything from armin's family background where he was just exposed to small businesses at a very young age and that continued to kind of really spiral into his path of just launch, um, launching the new locations for Moss Moss and all the experience that goes into what it takes. Like he was an accountant, he quits and doesn't really know that much about coffee and so what it really takes to learn about something completely different and actually operate a business where you're actually up running a business from like nine to nine at minimum and things we go through things like the operating issues of an espresso machine breaking at two in the morning and what do you do at that point for preparing for the morning rush and we go through other things like if i wanted to start a coffee shop what is the mental model that i have to employ to start a coffee shop and so we'll go through all these various cool aspects of operating a business and i really do hope that you find this interview as enjoyable as fun as i did and so without further ado please tune in all right hi everyone um today we're joined by the co-owner of moss moss coffee armin yesai armin thanks for taking the time to join us today thanks for having me yeah, and so you know, Moss Moss is a is a very popular joint in uh, I would say downtown Toronto's financial district. I I was a very um, I guess avid customer of Moss Moss when it first opened as well, and so a lot of the listeners that are working around that area will be very familiar with the name. And so you know, I I want to kind of dig back into your kind of childhood in terms of you know how this kind of came about. I ask this because. One of my coworkers back when I was a consultant, she would tell me about how, oh yeah, she used to grow up in Slovenia and how 
her parents owned a coffee shop, and so every morning she grew up, she wake up to the smell of like roasting beans, and so she's always loved coffee. Is that the kind of childhood that you grew up with, or how <laughs> how does that begin for you? Now, growing up in Toronto, it wasn't anything like that. I grew up in Richmond Hill. Okay. My life was really school and a lot of sports. It uh-huh. was volleyball, basketball, tennis, and that's kind of took me to university. Mm-hmm. In university, I started seeing, okay, you know, my family, my friends, a lot of people have small businesses. And mm. I saw people start from whether it was one retail shop or one construction site where they're building eight houses to now, hey, we just bought 18 acres of land and we're building 400 houses. So I really got to see more of the business side of things saying, okay, you know what? This is what I want to do eventually. Mm. And when I went to university, I was always in the summers, I would work in some sort of retail. I did in high school, I did extreme PETA. I did Hollister. I did the Bay. So it was always, okay, what are these places about? How am I going to take what I know? And in five, 10 years, kind of start my own thing with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So like your direct family also owns a small so, business as well? So yeah, my a lot of my family is in construction. Oh, okay. So that's where I saw, okay, how are they, like, what is this nine to five everyone talks about? I, <laughs> this, I don't see it. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. when I actually started working nine, well, not nine to five, but let's say right. quote unquote nine to five. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of unorthodox to me because I grew up seeing, oh, hey, I got a meeting at 7 a.m. in Whitby. So 5.30, I'm out of the door. And it's construction, so you're usually home by 334. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of what I saw growing up, and that's what I expected in myself. But in terms of actual coffee, that more started when I was in university, where I started drinking coffee. In at KPMG, I started drinking coffee, and I kind of just said, "What's what's this magic stuff?" Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that was how the coffee part started. Okay, yeah. And so you know, as we kind of lead into that, um, if when I look at your background on LinkedIn, for example, you went to school for criminology, um, and then you went into Ivy at University of Western Ontario, and then you go into be an accountant at KPMG. So you put on the suit, do the proverbial nine to five. It never is really nine to five, but yeah, that sense. And then you go into um, operating Moss Moss. So where where in that sequence does um, coffee continue to grow and where does the idea of um, transitioning into being like the small business owner that you constantly felt that you would be kind of come into play? So when I was at Western in my first two years, I, I wanted to actually be a lawyer. And I said, really? yeah. Okay. I took criminology and after about one week, I said, I don't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that. And then I said, you know what? It, it's always going to be business. And mm. that's what led me to Ivy. So Richard School of Ivy. Mm. Um, when I got there, they pretty much say, look, there's marketing, there's accounting, there's finance, there's yep. consulting. Yeah. It's the four major... <laughs> yes this is it. Like, this is what you have here. Pick one and have a nice day. Ah. So I said, I have no idea what I want to do yeah. again. So it was kind of, okay, what do I pick? Accounting. The classic phrase you hear is a CA opens your doors. Uh, so I uh. said, okay, sure. Let's open my doors because eventually, you know, I have no idea what I want to do, but I want to do something small business related. Mm. So a CA would naturally just be the best route. Mm. And when I was actually at KPMG, that's when I realized, you know, I made the right choice. Mm. This will allow me now to let's start my own business. Now I know from zero to a hundred, you know, the operations, you know, the marketing, you know, the finance, you know, the actual accounting, there's pretty much nothing you don't do at KPMG that will allow you to succeed in a small business in Toronto. Mm. And um, what, was there like a particular moment during your time there? Um, could you elaborate on like what gave you the confidence to say that? So I would say after my first year, because your first year you're thrown in there and you you have no idea what you're doing. Yeah, They'll yeah. say, hey, Armin, you do section X, Y, Z. And I just nod my head and I say, yep, I'll, uh, I'll get that done. And it's really just look what they did last year and try to figure it out. And mm-hmm. I realized 
problem solving of the accounting world is what I liked, where it's not very straight up in terms of if you're going to do this and there's no one to help you, you just figure it out. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized, okay, this is what I want to do, but on a larger scale and Mm. not just on an accounting scale. Mm. So I want to, okay, you know, here's a lease. How are we going to change this so it benefits us, but also the landlord says yes. Or here is, you know, a box of coffee, let's say. Mm -hmm. It's too expensive. What can we do to not sacrifice the quality and, you know, have a good price, good relationship with our supplier? So it's really just taking everything in the supply chain, Mm. which is kind of like taking everything I learned at KPMG after my first year and saying, this is what I want to do after I qualify. Mm. So it took around three years to actually get my CA, Mm -hmm. to get my working hours done. Mm -hmm. And then the day after I qualified, I went into my manager's office and they knew right away. Like they knew from a year and a half in, they knew the day I qualified, I'm I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. So he was really super supportive. He said, you know, I knew this day was coming. Kind of the talk, go follow your dreams, go do what you want to do. It's a little cheesy, but that that's what it was. So yeah. everyone knew I knew, and I just had to wait to actually qualify. And even during those last two years, you do gain a lot of experience because as you move up in KPMG, not when you're a junior, but when you're a senior, you're actually now working with, internally, you're working with KPMG partners who obviously have 20, 30, 40 years of experience. But also on the client side, you're working with CFOs, controllers not just let's say a junior accountant Mm -hmm. or an assistant something like that you're working with people who have been in the field for 20 30 years Mm -hmm. so they expect a lot from you and that's when you learn okay this what i learned today i have to take this into my small business because every single little detail here counts out there times 10 Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what KPMG taught me. And they say the classic phrase of, hey, get your CA, it'll open your doors. It it really does open your doors. Um, they say work-life balance, nine to five. Everyone knows it's audit at the end of the day. It's not nine to five. It'll never be nine to five. Mm-hmm. But there's certain keys, uh, relationships, networking events, and tools you'll learn from getting your CA that will allow you to become an investment banker, become a consultant, open a small business, become an actor. It really doesn't matter because it's so broad that you just learn really a solid set of tools, I would say, mm-hmm. in these three years where you're getting your seat. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I I think from my time back when I was in audit, I could definitely relate to the problem solving element, especially when you do get I think I was very fortunate that I had great mentors who threw me into the fire and allowed me to learn by, you know, just by trial. And I think that for me was the best way of learning. And yeah, I think uh, I was able to benefit greatly from that. I think for me personally, it might be a difference of clientele as well. I think because I was specialized in like investment banks and the large banks, it was hard for me to see the large, um, like boil down the large organization into a small scale just because we'd only be segregated into just doing oh, I'm just going to be an investment bank auditor and I'm just going to look at that mm-hmm. I'll only look at deals and so I was very good at knowing deals and learning about investments and stuff but that was my entire little world and so I did feel for, personally for me and that's why the lim- I felt I was limited in my learning and that's why I jumped into management consulting just because I felt that will open up my doors more in terms of my breath um but I guess from what you're telling me, like, it seemed like you had a much more um, potentially diverse set of experiences, but also even an opportunity to see businesses that weren't too big or at least be able to be in a role where you could see the bigger picture. Yeah. So one thing I did a lot was in audit, I worked with real estate. Oh, okay, yeah. And naturally, when you work with real estate, LOIs are one thing that's really big. And that's the one thing now is whenever a location comes up and we get an LOI or a lease, I'm like, I take this, I'm like, give me my pen, I'll see you guys in two hours. And you just classic do your auditing, your lease, same as we did before. So it's a lot of direct tools in that way where I 
did this three years ago a hundred times. This is just the hundred and first time, hundred and second time. Yeah. And yeah, there were some other smaller clients in my internship. I actually did enterprise, so those were way smaller clients. Right. Yeah. And for the audience that don't know, KPMG Enterprise does like the private small businesses, right? And you'll get to see like the whole picture. And I think even some of my colleagues in enterprise, you sometimes it's just like a solo auditor, it's just you in a one man team and you do the full audit yourself yep. yeah so in my in that the first job you could say the two week job it was just me and a senior and you know you're an intern you're 18 and I go in there and I'm just like wow this is this is corporate life yeah <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing I take the laptop he's just clicking away and that's it just me and him and I thought there would be you know a boardroom of 10 guys in a suit and nope this is what it is and this is real life so it was a it, it was a good start for mm-hmm, sure mm-hmm. yeah so honestly sometimes i actually think like when i was younger when i first joined audit i actually you know i said i wanted to do like financial institutions i want to have big banks as my clients but in hindsight i really do think i would have preferred to have gone to enterprise or done a lot of small businesses as clients just because and i think i'd get so much of the learning and given what I'm doing now and what I want to do in the future, like I want to have my own small businesses as well. I think it just would have been much more transferable than just really knowing how to do a corporate finance revenue audit, for example. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you know you got this great experience, and now yeah, that that transition into coffee. Like how how did that come about? So it, the exact story was when I was at KPMG. Yeah. Obviously, the one thing you look forward to is coffee breaks. Yeah. Like, hey, guys, we get 10, 15, 20 minutes. Let's go downstairs for a coffee. So at that time, occasionally, we would go to Moss Moss. And there was one location in Commerce Court. And I knew, so one of my really good friends, which is my business partner now, his uncle actually started the brand. Oh, okay. So his uncle started Commerce Court. Uh Uh-huh. And that was it. There was one Moss Moss one coffee shop and you know my partner said hey this is my uncle he started he started moss moss it's okay let's go there every day so i started going there a lot more and just talking to him oh how does this work how does that work Mm -hmm. what do you think about this what do you think about that and just picking his brain Mm. and then one thing led to another and and there were just so many people that would come up to him and say hey you know i love the brand i want a franchise or hey where are you guys going? What's the future of the sprint? Mm-hmm. And that's when me and my partner said, we think we can take this and make it into something big. So we kind of partnered up with them and said, hey, let's see what we can do with Moss Moss and let's see where we can take it. So that's when I left KPMG right away. I started barista, like literally behind the counter making lattes, making cappuccinos, making flat whites. I went to barista school. I went to cupping classes. So cupping is, for those who don't know, it's how you kind of judge coffee. Okay. Um, You would take a sip with a spoon and you kind of slurp it. It's a little gross, but you slurp it and then you have a cup on the side where you spit your coffee back in and then you're kind of sitting at a communal table and you say, okay, let's talk about the physical elements of that coffee. Oh, wow. So that's how you get a evaluation in, let's say, KPMG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In coffee, you do cupping. And every coffee is done blind, so you have no idea whose is who. It can be your coffee. It could be person X, person Y. It can be a, an instant coffee. The whole point of this is you have communal judging, and it's all done blind. So it's a really good system. Uh, that's when I really developed, you can say, a palette for coffee. Yeah. And when I left KPMG, it was just nonstop YouTube, Google. Oh, there's this class. There's this show in LA. There's this show in Toronto. Let's go to Seattle. I want to see this store. And you kind of just say, I want to know everything. And that's when you really get passionate about what you're doing. And that will allow you to say, it's not really work anymore. You're enjoying and you're learning every day. Mm -hmm. So... It doesn't matter. Now it's nine to nine. So what? You know, I actually like what I'm doing. I want to learn more. So that's kind of how the coffee started. Uh, Commerce Court was there. 
And at that time when I left KPMG, we were discussing with Brookfield for our second store. That would be our exchange tower location. So that opened in April, 2017. Mm. That one went well. Uh, I was just there today and walked over here. Everything's going well. You know, we're introducing new products. And then we said, okay, what's next? Water Park Place, which is 20 Bay Street, which is just across, uh, across from here. That was Oxford. So they came along saying, hey, we saw your Brookfield Place store, sorry, Brookfield Exchange Tower store. And, you know, we like what, we, what you do. What do you think of this location? So the location at 20 Bay Street was previously a second cup. And we said, you know, we love the location. So we took that over in December, uh, 2017 and we opened mid dis yeah, we opened in December and then now we have our fourth location that will be opening this December and we have a fifth one in the winter coming as well. So, I mean, it's going good. Wow. We're that's, that's kind a of a lot of expanding. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's once you have, you, you believe in your product, you believe in your experience, you believe in your staff. I mean, why wouldn't you expand? That's what we're here to do. And we think we have the controls in place, the operations in place that will allow us to expand, but not dilute the brand. Right, right. And so I, I kind of want to take a step back and um, touch upon that earlier moment when you decide, okay, I'm going to leave. But, you know, at that point, you had you hadn't been a barista, you yeah, hadn't so, done any yeah. cupping classes. And so yeah. you, you quit with the idea of, I think I'm going to really enjoy running a coffee business. Like how, where did you get the kind of certainty or how did you get over that lack of certainty if that was the case? Yeah. So there definitely was no certainty when yeah. people, you know, especially in the accounting world, it's get your CA and, you know, go be a controller, go be a VP finance. And, you know, you'll have two weeks off before your new job. This right. was just quit and go learn coffee. Yeah. So it was totally 360. But during KPMG, I was always speaking to our now partners. Still, I, I wouldn't say I had any advanced knowledge in coffee, but I was always trying to learn kind of on the side by myself. Okay, what is drip coffee? What is this coffee belt? Or what does this mean? How do you do this better? How do you do that better? Yeah, yeah. But it was really more, okay, we think we have the business background in terms of operations to take this to the next level. Mm -hmm. We think the brand is, is, or, and could be one of the best coffee brands out there. Mm. And we really looked at the marketplace. So five years ago, you really had Starbucks in a class on its own. Mm. You had Starbucks top tier coffee. You had Tim Hortons on the other side, and then you had your kind of stragglers, second cup, Timothy's and all these bigger chains mm -hmm. kind of in the middle. Mm. So depending on who you were, you would say, okay, I'm a, I'm a Starbucks drinker or, you know, Timmy's double double is for me. So we saw a big gap from Timmy's to Starbucks saying, okay, there's a huge gap that is unattended to. If you're just doing X or Y, how about there's so many more options for coffee. So that's when you really started to see this thing that we call the third wave coffee. Mm. So it's a lot of coffee purist style where you go in you know, they only make one drink at a time. It takes a little bit longer, but the drink is made and measured and made to perfection, you can say. So we took that idea and we took the idea of Starbucks and said, you know, we think we have a great product, but so does everyone else. You know, other people have great coffee. Other people have great espresso. What can we do to be different? And that is the experience. Mm. So the experience that we have in Hanukkah, kind of how Moss Moss works is when you arrive at the store, it's more like a restaurant type grab and go coffee. Right. So instead of ordering over a cashier, that's kind of become mundane now. It's boring. Hey, can I have a double double? Okay, thanks. Have a nice day. What can we do differently? And that's when the sticker system kind of right. came about. So what the sticker system is, is every single drink is, has a corresponding sticker. So if you want a latte, you take, you physically grab a latte sticker, you put it in the middle of your cup, and then one of us will write your name on the cup. What that allows us to do is 
two things. Number one is you know you have your sticker. If you're a matcha kind of person, that's your sticker. You bring your friend, now you're teaching them, saying, hey, look, these are how the stickers work. If you want a coffee with one milk, you grab this sticker. If you want a double-double, you grab this sticker. So it's very intuitive. It's very informative. And, and more anything, it's fun. You don't just say, hey, just drink your coffee and kind of walk away. You want that break, especially in the financial district. You're working 12, 10, 15 hour days. You just need 10, 15 minutes to moss moss. So what moss moss actually means is it's a dialect of Swahili. The direct translation is cut the noise and savor the moment. Oh, really? Yeah. So oh. that's something we've now implemented in our third, fourth, and fifth store. Yeah. If you look at the back wall, there's a huge moss moss and it'll say, it'll look kind of like a dictionary definition and it'll say number one, cut the noise, number two, savor the moment. And we've also now put that on our ice cups, trying to say, hey, look, this is what moss moss means. This is why we're calling it moss moss. Yeah. You know, just take 10 minutes, relax, drink your coffee, and then go back to doing whatever you got to do. Right, right. So in terms of what's next in the process, we would take your cup after you put it on the sticker and we put on your name. You would then follow the line where we have a range of goodies, treats, and how we did these goodies and treats and says, look, anyone can make a chocolate chip cookie. It is what it is, right? So how can you do something that's different? What can you add to your chocolate chip cookie or what can you add to your X cookie or X brownie that says, oh no, you know, I want to go to Moss Moss, not XYZ shop. So every single product that we have is has a little twist on it, whether it's from an international supplier, whether we make it ourselves and, and add you know, some newer products to it. We don't want to just sell something you can buy somewhere else. We want you to have an experience and say, I'm going to Moss Moss because I want their goo cookie or whatever that product, or I want a matcha cookie. So that's kind of the cookie and treats area. Now, when you put your sticker on the cup and we take it, it allows us to start your drink a lot earlier than if you order over the cashier. So we would now take your cup and it, whether it's a latte or a coffee, we would make your actual drink we'll, almost before you're at the cash. So when you're at the cash and you say, hey, I had a small coffee, your coffee's almost done. So usually you order and then you have to wait two, three minutes. We're trying to pretty much kill the bottleneck. And that's something we took away from the business world saying, what do people not like doing is waiting, right? Everyone's busy. We, we know it everyone's got to go so once you pay or we want you to wait 30 seconds one minute max and say here's your half sweet vanilla almond latte we made it that fast so that's how the that process would go if if you do get a brewed coffee or drip coffee what we're really known at is we only use steam milk so if you were to get a coffee with two milks or one milk we don't have a physical milk bar we have only steam milk. So you would just tell us what it is and we do the rest. You get your coffee. At the end of the coffee line, we call it our, our pour station or where we would call your name. That's where we kind of do the last touch of creativity and add something on top. So if you were to get a brewed coffee, I would say small coffee for Daniel. When you're walking towards me, you'll see that all our baristas are putting this powder on top yes yes yeah that powder is just coffee so it's coffee dust where it's a little silver kind of beaker container type device where a tiny bit goes on top and we make a quick two second design on it and it just adds an extra kick to your coffee and we also it allows us to make a nice design with it the, all you got to do after you get your coffee is put on your lid if you know if you even oh, there's a lot of people now drinking without a lid and mm -hmm. then that's it we do the sugar we do the milk if you want almond milk if you want it doesn't matter we're really trying to customize every single drink for whoever it may be but also not sacrifice speed and quality so that's kind of how the operational line of a store would go 
And as we evolve, we always add some stuff or, you know, change a little here, change a little there. And that's how when we went from Commerce Court to Exchange Tower to Water Park Place, we're always innovating or always changing this and saying, okay, you know what? We think customers will like X over Y. So let's put that into place. So, yeah, that's really about the ops and kind of how the business will work in terms of just ordering a normal coffee. And yeah, I mean, no, that, that, that was a, that was a lot, but <laughs> no, no, that's, uh, that's honestly truly fascinating. I think when you were telling me about the operations, what, what it reminded me of was, so this, um, this past summer I went to Vienna with my family and I went to a lot of art museums and I'm not much for art. Like I look at it and I go, that's cool. It's, it's like a red square. Yeah, same. Okay, yeah, it's, it's um, but like I, w- I was looking at these Picasso pieces, and I was like, I don't really understand why he's so famous. And I had an audio guide, and it was explaining to me why this picture was famous. Was like the thought process of the artist that went into creating like a particular painting, and I loved it so much that I ended up buying a postcard for the painting. And I didn't notice all the thing, like the details that you mentioned, like because. I went. To, I go to Moss Moss a lot, and yeah, I use the sticker. I wait in line and I pay at the end, and I see the coffee dust coming on the drinks. But when you explain that to me, like, it just kind of started clicking in terms of, it's true. Yeah, like, I, it's different. The sticker thing is different, and I do get a different experience because someone actually asked me for my name, and we kind of have like light banter, kind of chatter, and by the time I'm paying, my coffee is actually already ready. But yeah, now that you explain it, I'm noticing all the things that actually were in place and so it's actually very fascinating especially because you're describing the thought process that actually went into it and now i think i can get a better appreciation of it and hopefully the audience will get a better appreciation of it of it as well and so you did mention about like the third wave of coffee and you know i i love coffee and i've i i think i can confidently say i've been to probably about 80 percent of all the coffee shops in like the downtown kind of area and like my ideal Sunday is like four hours at a coffee shop, take a break and go to another coffee shop for four hours. Like that's my jam. It's a good Sunday. And uh, yeah, exactly. And so I've been noticing a lot of other coffee, like local Toronto coffee shops, you know, like Pilot, Early Bird, Denise, you name it, all kind of expanding and growing their locations as well. So how does that kind of competitive landscape look from your perspective in this Toronto coffee scene? So, yeah, Third Wave is really, really growing. Yeah. I just came back from a coffee show in L.A. where you can say them in Seattle are doing Wave 3.5, where they just have, if you think Toronto has a lot of coffee shops, you should go there. It's it's unbelievable how many mm-hmm. shops they have. But at the end of the day, they are more of, you can say, a coffee purist type play, where we like to focus on having a really really broad menu where we have things like a match our matcha is actually from japan mm. our card we have a cardamom chai we have a masala chai we have taro latte none of these things are from canada so what we're focusing on is what can we have in our menu that will allow us to say oh hey i want to go to moss moss because of this drink mm. because of that drink You know, I want to go get their mango chai. I want to go get their vanilla chai. Or we have a a latte Mumbai. So what we're doing is taking an international spin on things, but also focusing on the experience. So we can't lose the sticker system. We can't lose, you know, the way that light conversation, that feeling you have when you walk into the store. We want to be different. So... These other coffee shops, Early Bird, Deneen, Pilot, they're all good. I mean, having good coffee in today's age, a lot of people do have good coffee. But what are those details that you put into your coffee or into your store that will make you different than the next store? And that's what we're really focusing on now is let's not really focus on six things. You know, let's have an espresso, an Americano, and a drip coffee. Let's have... 30 things and make sure if you want x and you you know you're a you're a coffee guy you want a an espresso you're just going to get a double shot and then but your friend wants a triple triple we have both Mm -hmm. we don't want to limit our menu for someone 
who doesn't know anything. I don't really like coffee. Do you have a tea? Yeah, we have 24 teas. So take your pick. Do you want a tea latte? We have 10 tea lattes. And they go, wow, okay, I'm going to find what I like. So it's really taking this third wave type coffee and combining it with what we have today. And you can say whether that's wave 3.5 or 2.5, that's more what we're doing with our future. And we're just, you know, keep being different, keep innovating and keep serving good coffee. Hmm. And like, I think the big, the, the item that really piqued my interest was the Mumbai latte that you just said. So yeah, so our, then that's what I mean. It's these little, it's these stickers and it's these names where you say like, what is a, what is a Mumbai, our Mumbai latte is actually from India. Oh. So when someone tastes our, our Mumbai latte and our masala chai is, is imported directly from India. So when they taste it, they go, wow, this is like back home or this is like how I I was just in Mumbai or New Delhi last weekend and it tastes the same. So what we're trying to do is saying, yeah, you know, India makes the best chai out there. That's just, you know, if you want matcha, you go to Japan. It, It is what it is. So we're not trying to compete with India or Japan. We're trying to now say, okay, you know, they do have the best products. Let's bring it in from the best place you can possibly bring it in. And that's going to make our product superior. Mm. And that's kind of how we believe in every product. So let's say our taros from Taiwan. Mm. So it's not like where you, you know, Oh, I can just have this down the street. It's you got to go to Taiwan to have this. So yeah, it's really just an international twist on things because especially Toronto being number one in the world, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, we're in, one, of, one of the top for sure. In yeah, like multicultural. Yeah, right? Like, you, you know how multicultural it is, right? Yeah. You have, so we just have a new drink. It's called an iced Lao latte. It's from Laos. So wow. someone, it was two, three weeks ago, someone's like, oh, this, this literally tastes like what I have back at home. It is what you have back at home. It's from Laos. It's directly imported. It's how you import these items and figure out the logistics that becomes now the harder part of selling these products and making sure the consistency okay if it's from india how are you going to monitor the consistency so these are the things that the challenges that come up with these international products but without these products you won't keep innovating you won't have that oh what's next i heard like what are they going to do for halloween or for christmas right we're always we already know what we're doing for halloween and christmas so what's for summer right you always have to be ahead of the schedule so wow and, and so then um when you know when you're doing all this international sourcing and stuff do you you know just fly over there and like meet a lot of different you know coffee drinkers there or the coffee shop owners and test things out and like do you learn how to make like a taro latte and bring it back home like how does that how does <laughs> yeah, that work so, i mean i wish i flew around the world just trying <laughs> just trying drinks and cookies all day but unfortunately uh, it's a little tough tough with time with that so Mm. it's more you you know you a lot of you research things so okay Mm. i heard these three are really good you ask around and i'm gonna literally pick up the phone and give them a call so you just hope they speak english if not then you figure it out Mm. i mean there's really no answer if you call company x in japan and i know a couple words in japanese or you call (laughs) company x in spanish and sorry in spain i know how to speak spanish so okay, hey, I heard this is amazing. Can you give us a sample? Who Do you have a distributor here? They go, no, we have a distributor in the U.S. Here's their number. Here's contact this person. Okay, now let me go that way. Yeah. So it really depends on how big the company is. Do they have a distributor? Are you, can they even speak English? So, I mean, there's really no, hey, do X, do Y, do Z. Every single product, every single drink is different. So you're always just keep going with the flow. So, I mean, if you have a really good matcha, that doesn't mean you should stop. Mm. Like, where's the next one? You know, I heard there's an even better one coming or the same company is working on a better one. So I was just, when I was in LA, I was talking to the main alternate milk is called Pacific. It's the main, you'll see it all. Like if you go get an almond latte or soy and they're just doing 
R&D and R&D and they're like we're coming up with this in three months and this in three months and this in six months and I'm like wow I've, I've never even heard of that and they're like no it's it's coming to the US in three months it'll come to Canada in a year so it's really just how can you get ahead mm. and stay ahead of the curve mm. so that's kind of how we deal with our international suppliers okay wow no, like it's it's just really cool just hearing about you know all the various operations like the logistics everything like the nitty gritty stuff that actually goes into running a small business yeah I mean I mean I wish I could just fly there and <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that that's pretty much out of the option so I mean sometimes you can right depending right. on what it is or where it is but yeah. it's hard to just fly over the world right even though it'd be nice yeah no definitely and um, and so you know now you know you've you're expanding you have like your fifth six locations all coming up um but you know so in hindsight your friends can say oh yeah like i, I knew you'd do well <laughs> i knew uh you know Aaron would be like successful your family might be ha- you know i'm sure they're really proud of you for doing that but what was the what was your initial reaction when you told you know your close friends your family was like yes yeah, so i'm gonna quit um i'm gonna go be a barista and i'm gonna roll open up some coffee chains and we're going we're gonna to see how that goes. How, yeah, so how did that fly? That was an interesting conversation. I yeah. see the initial, everyone's like, wait, what? <laughs> yes, like classic you're, first reaction. Uh, yes. yeah, uh, you're going to a co- like you're going from KPMG to a coffee shop. I, I just don't get it. Right. And you know, I try to explain to them, but at that time there was only one location. So right. I'm trying to explain to them and they're just like, I mean, I, I don't get it. And I'm like, you you need to see the store. You need to see our vision that we have for the brand. Then you would really understand what we're saying. Mm. So they were a little surprised. My family and friends were, you know, I always thought he was a numbers guy. He was just going to kind of move up the corporate ladder, maybe go to another job or, you know, VP finance. It's the classic accounting to exit opportunity. But after about six months... They start, they, well, when we opened the second store, they said, oh, that's pretty cool. You guys have two stores. And then, you know, they came to the actual stores and that's when you realize, oh, I get what he's doing. Uh, so until you, I can sit here and talk about and say, you know, Mothmas is this, Mothmas is that. But the only way you truly understand what it is, is come to one of the stores, any store, any time. And then you'll kind of realize, oh, okay, I see these guys. This is their vision for the future. So then when we opened the third store, that's when my family and friends said, okay, I got it. I get where you're going with the brand. I get what you're trying to do, you know, how you expand. I get it now. But a lot has changed in the last year and a half, two years in terms of the initial response to what it is now. Now it's a lot of excitement saying, hey guys, we're doing our fourth one in December. Oh wow, like where is it? What are you doing? Are you doing anything different? Are you gonna have this? Are you gonna have that? Is it a sit-down one? Is it open on the weekends? That's something where now it, it it's fine because we're always saying, okay, where's the next one? You know, what can we do that's different, but we don't want to, you know, go too far away from the vision. So it's always adding a small little twist to it, but keeping what we have done in the other three as well. Mm-hmm. And um, you spoke about how uh, now, you know, after like the third store, everyone's like, "All right, great, yeah, I I can see it now." Um, but I think when you mentioned about how even for the water, water water place, water park, yeah, yeah. water park, uh, how Oxford approached you guys and said, "Hey, do you want to do something like the Exchange Tower at our place?" So now you have someone coming to you. But before then, when you're at the first location and looking to expand to the second one, and you're doing all that cupping and looking at all those YouTube videos. Did you ever have moments of doubt or sometimes of questioning your choices in terms of, is this really going to work? Is this really what I want to do? Will this turn into a passion? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of times yeah. during those, when we had the first store and the second store, we would meet other landlords. But there would a lot of, oh, what's, uh, oh, mo- Moss Moss? And then you know, okay, they have no idea who we are. Mm. And that's when it's not doubt, you would say. It's more, okay, how can we change how they're thinking that? Mm. So when someone, when we met a new landlord, whether it was in Toronto or wherever, 
we and they had no idea who we are that was something kind of to myself i said okay we need to do something that this landlord in six months when they see us that this conversation doesn't happen again mm. so what can we do is it build a new website so that's one thing we're doing now is we're we're kind of if you go on our website right now it's it's uh moss moss is coming coming back soon you know let's build a 2.0 website that really goes in line with our brand our mm. vision okay how about social media everyone has instagram these days what can we do there how about the physical stores how about this how about that how about our pos how about our advertising our marketing it's really just what can we do so we don't have this conversation anymore and in terms of doubt i wouldn't say there were never days where i said oh man like i wish i stayed at kpmg mm-hmm. kpmg that i never had because as i said it's it's always problem solving you never want to just say oh okay i'm done i i give up because once you say that it, it's done yeah so you couldn't really say that at kpmg like oh i have um i have to do this section i don't know how to do it you know i'm just not going to do it yeah so it's pretty much it relates to the same thing in this in a small business you can't ever doubt yourself even when you want to or oh man and like this happened and you know this broke and that broke and this lease is uh we're still negotiating it and it got pushed back six months like wow that is just bad news after bad news instead of more dwelling on the past what am i going to do right then that is going to allow me to okay so what my old espresso machine broke pick up the phone call your eight new suppliers who maybe it's a good thing it broke so what's next is there an espresso machine that is just out of this world that will allow you to make better espresso it'll allow you to make better steam on your milk-based beverages so that's kind of how i approach the situations of doubt with okay i gotta fix this right away so i you know i call my partner or he'd call me and say this happened and that's what i would say our business background allowed us to do is oh like 8 p.m so there was one day where security called me at 1 a.m saying hey your uh your condenser is it's making some super weird noises go to the shop it's 1 a.m and i say okay well i'm calling them i'm calling the fridge guy yeah he came at 2 a.m 4 a.m it was fixed we went home the next day no one even knew it i mean it is what it is right if something's wrong you fix it yeah you don't wait for something you don't wait for someone else there's always ways where whether it's at 2 a.m. or 2 p.m. or it takes one hour or one phone call, we've learned from, you know, from being in the business world, getting your CA. My partner was in investment banking. There's really no saying, oh, okay, we'll do this later. Uh, you know, it's okay. Just fix it, and that will allow you to keep growing or keep, you know, keep the vision that we have today. Yeah, and uh, that vision that you have for Moss like what is that vision, like, if you could describe that? Uh, so our vision for moss moss is really to become the next coffee player in the industry we started with downtown toronto because we definitely need a brand that everyone knows you know we can't just hot go do three shops in toronto and then open one in vancouver no one would know who we are so the way we want to do it is solidify a brand so our fourth and fifth location will also be downtown and then now okay your brand is growing so what's next is it somewhere on bloor is it yorkville is it york region and what do you guys want to do right and we get that question a lot it's we want to now slowly go out of downtown toronto and growing into these other areas i was mentioning but there's really no no stopping per se i mean we eventually we see montreal we see vancouver we see Calgary, we see East Coast. That's what our vision is to become Canada-wide coffee. And we believe that if you keep your product and if you keep that experience that we've done with the three stores, that'll allow us to grow and do what we want to do. Hmm. Wow, no, that's a solid vision. And I think, um, have you read the book um, Zero to One by Pierre Thiel? No. Are you, have you heard of it? No. Okay, so it's Peter Thiel. He's a tech entrepreneur down in Silicon Valley. He's one of the co-founders of PayPal. And 
he wrote a book called Zero to One where one of the concepts he has there is that you practically want to dominate a region before you even yeah. think about expanding anywhere else. And yeah, yeah I think when, when you're telling me that, that just book just popped into my mind in terms of, yeah, that's, that's generally how you would build any kind of advantage for your brand at least. Um, so yeah, no, that's, that's really cool. Uh, and so if, so I love coffee. I love coffee shops, and one of the things that I do sometimes dream about is actually owning my own coffee shop in the future. So if I wanted to open up a coffee shop and I came to you to consult me on it, what are the kind of steps that you'd lead me through in terms of going from zero, like nothing, to actually like starting and getting my first like one coffee shop? Yeah, so the first, first thing I would say, do you like coffee? Mm -hmm. right away mm -hmm. if you are doing it alone and you have no partners that like coffee mm -hmm. if if you don't love what you do you're not going to love it mm. you know there's going to be times where someone will have a specific question about your coffee someone will say x someone will say y doesn't work mm -hmm. you have to really love coffee so let's get that off the table next it would be okay what are what's your vision for your coffee store is it this third wave type you know do you want a 200 square foot spot where people just come grab and go and leave or are you looking for something where it's 1800 square feet you want to serve some sandwiches and soups and make it more into like a lunch style coffee shop now you narrow down okay this is what you like at that time you really need to know your vision now so what do you is do you just want to open one coffee shop or do you want to have 10 coffee shops do you want to do anything special what what do you want to do what do you like doing mm. and then after we kind of get all the subjective questions out of the air it would be okay now the hardest thing will be getting a lease at a fair rate so when you are just a single person entity that is trying to open a coffee shop so with these i mean it's tough right brookfield oxford cadillac they don't they won't know who you are they'll say who is joe smith right they no idea so you know i can't with them sorry so now you're gonna, you know, okay, I can't open in the path, maybe I can open in distillery district or wherever you wanna open. The number one thing is location. So if you wanna open, you know, in X area and you can't get a lease and you just say, you know, whatever, I'll open in Y area, are you sure? You know, you have to be 100% sure because once you commit to a lease, you're not getting out of it, right? You're gonna open a store, you're gonna create a brand, you're gonna buy, thousands and thousands worth of equipment and set up your suppliers and really spend months of your time. So you have to be 100% certain. So picking your location is really key because you would have done lots of market research. You say, okay, I see three coffee shops here. I see uh, X amount of people going into this coffee shop, You know, Y amount of people going into that coffee shop. And I think there's room for me here. And okay, why is there room now? Now, how are you going to get a great product? That That isn't hard, right? That isn't hard because there's so much great coffee out there. But what is hard is dealing with your suppliers and getting it at a fair price and making sure logistically, okay, my coffee gets delivered Monday, Wednesday, Friday. What happens if the driver's sick? What happens if there's traffic on the DVP? What happens if your machine breaks? Now, what happens if one day my coffee isn't consistent? That's where the problems come in. So you really need to go meet your suppliers and see, okay, you're telling me you're really good at roasting? Okay, let me, I'll stay there for the entire day. I'm gonna just watch you guys roast. Mm. Okay, now I get how you do this. I get, okay, if this goes down, that happens. I see that the quality is always 10 out of 10. You know, you're following it by the book. You're adding even more value when you do this and when you do that. I really feel comfortable with this supplier. Now, how do I make sure logistically this supplier delivers to me? And, you know, how do I know how much to order? Because the one thing about coffee is you definitely, definitely don't want it just sitting there because it, it just won't taste good. Mm -hmm. So you want it fresh. So let's say you order X amount of kilograms oh man, like it's sitting there for a month. Well, after two weeks, it's already, it's pretty much garbage. So now are you even coming out financially positive? Is that, you know, how's that going? So there's so many little questions where 
we would, we would sit down and we would say, okay, number one is, do you love coffee? Number two, location. Number three, your physical coffee. Number four, suppliers. And number five, your controls. So how will you do scheduling? How will you do payroll? How will you do f actual, are you gonna text someone to order milk? Are you gonna pick up the phone? Do you use an app? How do you make sure you have what you need and it stays fresh? How do you wanna, you know, if person X is sick and they can't come into work, how do you now, okay, they're opening the store and they're sick, what do I do? Right, so you need to put all these processes in place and you'll have them all on a piece of paper and say, okay, here are my, my here's my business model. This is my answer to each one. Okay, now it comes down to the last question is finances, right? You obviously, are you comfortable with taking the risk or is this something you don't feel comfortable with? Are you going to use your own money, your family and friends money, a bank? I mean, that's all, at the end of the day, that's up to you. It, but you just have to be comfortable comfortable you know you have to put out money build a store get this equipment get that equipment and then you'll see okay if i don't give a good product or a good service I, it's not going to be cash flow positive so you're pretty much done so you have to make sure those five things are really solidified and then you can justify your finances but when you actually open the store as I said before, right? Lots of coffee shops have, have great coffee. The number one, in my opinion, the number one most important aspect is HR. So if you have good coffee, you know, your beans are great. What if you're making it wrong? What if your staff are doing something wrong or adding something they shouldn't be? Or, you know, they're not giving that friendly, upbeat experience that you want in a coffee shop. There's a certain drama and atmosphere coffee shops have right that's why people spend sundays there yeah if your staff aren't now replicating that to your customers it doesn't matter if your product's good because oh like i went in there and you know nothing just i felt oh yeah it's a good coffee mm -hmm. yeah you know i'm gonna go down the street where they also have great coffee but they're you know they know me by name they do this they do that that for me that is one thing where especially in coffee shops like we have if you come at 9 a.m., we have eight or nine people working. Staff is number one, right? They're the ones who are going to show your brand to the world. They're the ones serving your actual product. They're the ones who run the store, right? When I go in and, oh, we thought this was operationally more efficient, you know, I just moved the milk from X counter to Y counter, you know, go ahead. That's what you guys are there to do. You know better than us because you are the the face of our brand and that's the way we want to carry the brand saying okay you know i want to go to moss moss because i really like their matcha but also i have two friends they're always there they're so nice and we talk about this and we do this and that's the the aspect that you cannot lose when you keep growing so whether you have one store or 10 stores personally i would like to know all every single staff by name you know what they do for fun, et cetera, et cetera, right? You really need to know them and you need to get them to believe in the brand. Once they believe in the brand and believe in the product, that's when you'll see like it is, it just flows. So that's the the biggest piece I would say is definitely HR. Man, I got a, I got a, I got chills when you said that just because, <laughs> um, so it's actually something I preach a lot and as an investor, that's actually a very big thing that I do look towards as well when I when I would look at public companies when I interview CEOs because, you know, when you think of a great company, you, the first thing people always look at is, okay, does it have high return on invested cash flow, uh, invested capital? And you go, okay, so does it ha can it have high ROIC for like 10 years? Yeah. But then, okay, how do you get high ROIC? Okay, well, you got to generate cash flow. Okay, um, you have either gross sales or cut costs okay there's operational efficiency or excellence that can focus on the bottom line and then you have you know, how are you going to get great you know increase in sales customer support customer services everything about the customer right and okay how are you going to get great customer service oh your employees give great customer service but your employees probably won't give great customer service if they don't feel 
like they're taken care of. You yeah. gotta take care of your people first, and then the chain just all starts from there. And so when you uh, when you just said like, oh yeah, HR stuff is normal, I I definitely related to that one, and definitely got excited when you're telling me about that too. And yeah, it does matter, I think, especially for coffee shops because one one of the one of your competitors, um, I'm not gonna name the name, but a friend of mine was a barista there, and so I went very often. And as soon as my friend started working there, I started going more often because. I started to get you know get to know the other staff members too, and slowly I saw the whole staff kind of turning over, and my friend quit as well. And I said, "What happened?" And uh, he was saying, "Oh yeah, they're treating us like terribly, and we're all gonna quit." And now it's all new faces, so I don't even recognize anybody in that coffee shop anymore. But uh, before I was in Toronto, I was in I was working in Calgary for a bit. I went to this one single coffee shop all the time, and everyone there knew me. They knew my order exactly. Like yep. I'd come in and say. Oh, you're gonna get a med- medium coffee with an almond croissant? And I was like, oh, not today. But they they knew they knew just right away. And if I'm not there on like a Saturday and I'm going the next week, they'll say, oh, we missed you. Where were you? And I was like, oh, I was traveling. But yeah, yeah like that people aspect was super important. And I think yeah, when you take care of your people first, uh, definitely shows. And that's I think how you actually generate that um, to your customers. So no, that was that was really cool. Um, <laughs> hearing you yeah. say that. I mean, even look at KPMG, right? How many hundreds of thousands do they say oh you know we need to spend this to attract top talent and when i was there i was like they keep saying okay the big four is the big four right you know they're all massive they all pretty much do generally the same work it's just their clients are different the people the people the people and i remember when i was interviewing what like that's all they say is you know do you fit here or do you fit at pwc or do you fit at ey or are you more of a deloitte kind of person and in the beginning i was just like i, I don't get it like I think they're pretty much all the same and then when I did the interviews right away after a half hour I was like I get it I get it right away I started KPMG and I saw like okay the fit between the people me and my friends that are at this big four versus the other big four you know right away that what they're saying by the people the culture and now that's one thing I I think they got it you know spot on is it's everywhere it's not just kpmg it's not just coffee shops it it really is everywhere you go into a retail store and they're selling shoes that's the same thing if you don't you know the staff the shoes are going to be great but i have there's 500 pairs of shoes how am i going to know which one to choose right there's 40 40 different drinks at a coffee shop i've never been there how are your staff going to take the vision and you know take that person and make them feel warm and comfortable and give them what they want mm. so i mean it's it's a no-brainer for me definitely hr is number one yeah and you know we went through a lengthy i guess overview of okay what what goes in the mind of someone who is actually operating a business so if we went down now to the nitty-gritty and so if you so i think we were supposed to have our interview yesterday but something came up and so we pushed back to today and so if you could describe to me your day yesterday like yeah, what what goes on? Like, when do you start? Well, that, um, and the, can you give me through like take me through like the hour by hour of like what well, goes I mean, into your mind? Coffee day. is uh, coffee is more an earlier thing. Yeah. So our stores open at six thirty. Uh-huh. All three stores. Our staff are there at five thirty ish. Every day, every single day is different, right? Like today, I'm sitting here doing the podcast. Yesterday, one of our espresso machines, I found it wasn't frothing that well. And I uh, just, I mean, by now I've, I've, it's been two years where I open these things up and uh, one of the tech is, the techs are my really good friends. So I called him, I said, Hey, look, like, why is this doing this? And he's just like, it's fine. I'm like, no, it's not. And he's like, you got like, well, you, you guys call me for like the littlest things. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'm always going to call you if one little <laughs> thing is up. So he just like, okay, unscrew this, look at this. And there was a small little wire that was bent. And that took an hour to find because these things are massive, right? You got to unscrew them. And so that was my 10 to 11, you can say. Yeah. I mean, the rest of the day, we have a couple new products we're working on. So the afternoon was spent with, you know, testing and experimenting. Uh, I went to all three stores, just, you know, say hi to the staff. Uh, So, you know, the order station, I took some orders for half an hour at each store. And then we're really, we're concentrating our design right now for our fourth store. So at night, it was really, 
okay, answer. Surprisingly, you'd, you'd be surprised how many emails you get. And I thought I'd leave KPMG, you know, look at my phone sometimes. I'm like, wow, 15 unread? Like, how does really? that even happen? Yeah, so it's really just, it's the same as KPMG. You're, you know, answer the emails. But this is like, okay, it's on you. So here's the design. Tell us your changes. If you don't want any changes, we're going to start building the store. So you can't slip, right? You got to look at the nitty gritty detail of how many inches is the TV off the floor, right? I think it's three inches too high, lower it, right? So now we're, we actually went back to the store at night and we took the plan that our designer had and we just remodeled it with everything in the store. So that was kind of our eight to 10 PM. But I mean, every, every day is different. And after this, I'll, uh, I'll definitely go to water park, see how everyone's doing, kind of check up on things, make sure that espresso machine that was a little funky is not funky. But I mean, that's what every day is just making sure if there's a tiny little thing that's wrong, okay, for some reason, like yesterday, like there was, our, steam, our steam was a tiny bit off. To us, that's a red flag right away. Like you, you're gonna fix that, you know, it could, it could be no problem at all, but right away, go to that store, fix it. You gotta attend to it. Or we're working on some apps that will help uh, kind of solidify and speed up our training. So that's something for, you know, we have the fourth store, the fifth store and etc. We want to make sure that whether you're there for one day, whether I'm making the drink or you're making the drink or someone who's been there for five years, that drink is the same. So as of now, that's always the same. And we want to just make sure what can we, what more controls can we put into place? And this goes back to, you know, controls from the accounting world, which is funny, but it's, it's honestly true is so no matter what, even if we take a customer and we've done this before where we have a customer three times a day and they're like, I just want to, like, I'd love, how do you guys do it? Come, come make a drink. And they get so excited and happy. And even if they make it, it should be the same as me making it. So what are these controls? And that's kind of what I'll do for the rest of the day is work on the this app I'm speaking about. So yeah. Wow. And I guess uh, the, the first point of curiosity is like when you go through the various like market testings and stuff, do you are you actually just approaching customers with, you know, like various different products and like, hey, want to try this out and just doing a lot of guerrilla testing? Oh yeah, there? like that's I mean that's the number one, right? You yeah. you make a drink, wait, 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 wait. try this. Oh. Try this, try that. What do you like better? Oh. And they'll say, Okay, I tried it a hundred times, it's obvious item B, that's the one they like better. Uh huh. And then we do a couple more tests. Okay, all our staff will try it. Or I'll say, Hey, what do you should we you know try this or do a little bit of this but it's the number one way you learn is you just ask customers yeah they're the ones who will be drinking the product anyways so if i personally think oh man I, this is great like this is gonna sell and i give it to 10 customers and five of them say mm, so so i guess i was wrong right yeah you need to know what the customers are thinking and that's something where what i like i mean i like dark black coffee espresso triple shot nothing in it that's not necessarily what our customers like so i have to put myself in their shoes and say okay maybe this is not not milky enough or maybe this is not sweet enough or maybe this is x or this is y so it's really just just ask i mean cut why wouldn't they want to try uh oh hey this is our new um, peppermint x or or our new pumpkin spice or our new whatever it may be wouldn't you as a customer want to try it and say oh wow it's really good or oh yeah sure i'll try it anyways so yeah oh no that's that's really cool and you know like you said a coffee shop is a daily business you have cost customers interacting with you every day and so i'm sure a lot of things happen like from logistics side supply side all that so what's what would you say is like the biggest obstacle that comes up in your mind that you've had to face so far and you went, damn, that, was, that the, was a tough one. The biggest obstacle for sure is with, is dealing with suppliers logistically mm. and then making sure, as I said before, your, your team, your HR, your staff is, has the same vision as you. So it's really just, okay, let's say we interviewed five people and you just sit back and say, I, I, I don't know why, like maybe none of them, none of them have our vision. 
but at, at the same time you can interview two people and say wow they're both amazing so it's really making sure that each and every staff really has the same vision and kind of okay i get the brand feeling and then with our suppliers is every supplier works totally differently some are super automated app only cutoff times everyday delivery you have windows for drop-offs and others are hey pick up the phone and call me and i'll deliver it at 6 a.m so it's not the corporate world where everything is structured per se right it's it's coffee sometimes they say oh you know the farm this happened it's strawberry saying oh they're out of season right now right so it's it's always changing and the suppliers are always changing because they're trying to do what we're trying to do is make everything easier so logistically oh hey guys we're switching factories that means you are going to have overnight delivery now okay if we have overnight delivery how does that work they need our key if they have frozen materials what if our freezer is full right it's just simple things that when i do them sure i mean let's i think you know move this and we're going to use this tomorrow but what if our fridge is full where do you put the milk so yeah. just like simple things that turn up to be okay these are kind of big problems do we need another fridge right but we don't have room for another fridge so what are you going to do okay let's have a double drop off where they drop off at 6 a.m and they drop off at 6 p.m now we're good so it's kind of just every working with all the suppliers and seeing okay what can we do with supplier x that'll be totally different than what we do with supplier y so that's kind of the to challenges you would say in daily day in daily operation damn oh that's really cool um and you know i th i think those are challenges that not a lot of people would see or yeah, even like definitely. understand like unless you actually like explain it to them that yeah like if the fridge is full then we gotta yeah, think I mean, about that, all these other things that, that was one where like we there was no like if you come into our water parks we, there's no room for a fridge it's all glass right so how are you you do a double drop off and the company's oh i've never done that before right like <laughs> and i'm like okay well let's try it out right yeah and they're like okay we're, you know it works well or the overnight delivery thing they downtown toronto is an absolute oh, nightmare to drive especially for your truck the truck doesn't clear the loading dock right like these little things that you just won't even think of and they're yeah. like hey the truck didn't clear the loading dock so i couldn't drop off your stuff i mean that's that's unacceptable right how do we fix that you go to an overnight delivery and they use a smaller truck and you you walk them through it once so 3 a.m you meet them and you say hey look put this here put that there put that there here's a list here's the key this checklist now is 100 percent objective nothing can go wrong and you clear the loading dock height so you're not saying my truck doesn't fit right like these little things like when that happened i was like huh you know that doesn't even surprise me anymore right yeah. it's always if it's not this, it's that kind of yeah. thing. So, oh, that's so that's just really that just gets me really like riled up just because that's so that's just so cool. And I think that's just especially coming from the perspective as an investor that I'm, or you know, even when you're an accountant, you only look at the financial statements, yeah. right? And even if you talk to some people, you still don't get the big picture until we go down into the problems that you see. And it's just very that's just really in, really insightful. Um, and so what do you think is the biggest misconception that your friends or family or sometimes like the media gets wrong about running a coffee shop? I think the, the number one misconception is, you know, it's coffee. How hard could it be? Right. I mean, <laughs> you just, you have milk, you have coffee and you have some machines and you just brew it. Yeah. I had the same misconception. I, I thought, okay, you know, it, it probably is hard, but when you actually dive in and you realize how many like how much okay like hmm, 10 milliliters versus 20 milliliters versus 15 that makes a difference milk is over full right these little problems that you would have never even thought of happen on a daily basis oh okay our um our condenser broke right you can't touch that stuff it's it's dangerous right you got to call a guy but it's 1 a.m but we need it for we open at 6 30 a.m what are you going to do right these are the things that i would have never thought about I, you know i just oh it, it's an oven it's not going to break like why would it break oh there's a there's a this leak and a that leak and your drainage is this and okay well what am i going to do it's a lot of kind of just figuring it out 
And then even with your equipment, we have, if you walk into our stores, you'll see we have a lot of equipment and nothing is from Canada. So that's the other thing saying, okay, this is German, that's American, that's Japanese, that's a, what am I going to do? Okay, call the, call the supplier because the distributor is too busy. Okay, I call the supplier, they don't speak English. Well, too bad, I got to fix it, right? So I got to get them to kind of walk me through it with broken English or I got to get an app that translate their language into like you just fix it right that's the the number one misconception is I just think there's so many problems that could happen that you would have never assumed happen on a daily or weekly basis yeah no I, I from what you're telling me definitely I think that's that can, I had that misconception too and I think it's it's really common like when people say oh yeah there's another coffee shop oh it's probably easy to yeah. run it's like yep. it's a water based business it's you just pour coffee and that's it but yeah I think from what you tell me like that whole logistical aspect is just crazy and so as we kind of round out to I think the final segment yep. of the interview um, what what kind of end vision do you have for yourself personally like if you could think out like 10 years time um, yeah what do you see and how do you yourself growing and things evolving so how we see a shelf growing is once we kind of solidify our downtown core we're going to slowly move out of downtown mm. again this goes back to having that team in place the hr in place that will allow you to grow mm. so having managers and district managers a regional general manager a provincial manager whatever that may be having a solidified corporate structure that will allow you to Okay, I, want, I need to do three stores in Calgary in 2021 in three months. How are we going to do that? Mm. So that's how we'll grow is have that corporate structure solidified. In terms of where I see myself in 10 years, I would personally like to be going store to store. Let's say, you know, today I'm going to see go to five stores in Montreal. So hop on a plane, go to Montreal, see how the stores are doing, right? One thing we never want to forget is the product. So, okay, today I'm going to Montreal. Tomorrow now, let's go back. The entire day is focused on what's next or how can we make what we have today better? How do we get ready for summer? How do we make this cookie or this sandwich better? So it's really just not stopping per se. Um, and I mean, in 10 years, we definitely think we'll be Canada wide if I mean that's the goal so hopefully I'll be in Vancouver one day in a roasting facility the next day and in Montreal on the third day so that's kind of where I see myself oh, that's, uh, yeah that's that's great and I really do hope that that does come it. to fruition in yeah. 2028 um, and so what's uh, what's the belief that you have that you think uh, goes against conventional wisdom So in terms of schooling or just anything. So the way Ivy kind of taught us was, hey, pick one of these four, right? You're going to do marketing, accounting, finance, or consulting. Okay, sure. I'll, I mean, I'll pick one. But what if I want to do something else, right? That's one thing where even just your classmates and the interactions you have with your class is, oh, I got an interview with uh, XYZ Bank. I got an interview with, you know, XYZ Marketing Company. It's, it's a atmosphere that it's good because obviously these companies are, are amazing, right? They teach you so much, but there's a part of me that says, what if I never did KPMG and I did something else? Where would I be today? Would we be ahead? Would we be behind? I don't know. But one thing I definitely, you can say it's cheesy, but if you don't like working where you're working, I mean, why are you working? At the end of the day, there's so many jobs out there and someone with an education background, you know, I went to, I got my kin degree. Okay. And then uh, I'm just going to get my master's and kind of figure it out. Do you really want to get your master's? No, I just, I mean, I have nothing. Uh, yeah, I'll just get it for the sake of getting it. Okay, well then, I mean, why? 
right? If you want to get it because you thoroughly enjoy it, then 100% do it. But the way kind of society has positioned ourselves today is just, especially in Toronto, is work, work, work. Like, you know, work comes first, nine to five. And I mean, it's nine to six, nine to nine, nine to midnight, whenever it may be. But you go over to Europe, it's a whole nother game. I mean, people really enjoy what they do nine to three there's some places that are eight to two i mean i've i've seen it all over the map but really enjoy what you're going to do and when you wake up you're excited you don't wake up and hit snooze on your alarm clock seven times and say "Ah," you know three more days till friday you wake up and you say okay cool like what am i going to do today so that's the one thing where i'd say a lot of people say don't don't take that risk don't jump off the bridge per se but you'll never know what you find right you can if it doesn't work it doesn't work you go back to doing you know whatever you were doing whether it be working for a large company or a smaller company in their accounting team but if you never go for it you'll never know so you'll look back in 10 years and say wow you know one of my good friends just just did it and they love what they're doing now and I really don't like what I'm doing. And at the end of the day, how important is money to you versus doing what you love? And that's a question that I can't answer for anyone, but that's a question where I'd say definitely sit back and without anyone else's opinion, what is it, right? Is it worth it to do what you're doing because of the money? Is it worth it to do what you're doing because of the opportunity for growth or are you just doing what you're doing because of the stigma of jumping out from such a great job and you're opening a a coffee shop right like you know why is it what you're doing right so that's kind of the the thing i'd say the most is love what you're doing for sure no 100 percent. i think it's like you mentioned especially in downtown Toronto specifically yeah. within our friend group as well I think there's a lot of droning where people just you're just doing your you clock in clock out kind of deal you don't think and I think what you said touched upon this really well in terms of just having intent with what you're doing actually knowing why you're doing something oh I'm going to do accounting because I want to you know learn the language of business I want to get my CA and then I'm going to do something do it with intent like actually think about what you're trying to do and actually do some introspection of why you know, ask yourself all these questions why are you doing this why are you doing that instead of just having a very blunt kind of first level thought of oh, i'm just going to do it it's a, it's a job and sometimes yeah like maybe you're tight on money maybe you just have to do this just to get money and that's cool but know why you're doing all these things and i think yeah those are really important things that um people should always consider to ask themselves like that was a question that I failed to ask myself in my early career, like back when I was in audit. And later on, eventually, I, f- I was forced to ask that question after, you know, going through multiple rounds of just hardcore busy seasons, and yeah. it just kind of came up. And I said, "Okay, now I'm finally asking that question." And that's when I left. Yeah. And I think, yeah, like people need to ask that que- question earlier on the better. Um, but yeah, no, great. It's a great belief and I think also great advice for people definitely in earlier parts of the career and also I think later parts of the career too. Like I'm anywhere, right? Yeah, yeah. like I'm spending a lot of time just constantly when I grab coffee, like asking my friends, like, Okay, like, you know, you, you don't want my advice on how to get into a hedge fund. You you want my advice on asking the right questions to yourself on why do you even wanna be an investor? Why do you wanna do this, for example? Um, yeah. So, no, this was an amazing conversation i really enjoyed it and so you know i want to give you a chance to you know give a shout out to your stores like your locations so our audience members can find it as well um yeah so please go ahead yeah for sure i uh, enjoyed it a lot it was it was cool it was my first experience really just talk about the business meet you and in terms of moss moss so we have three locations right now they're open from monday to friday they're in the path downtown first one's in commerce court and the second one is exchange tower the third one is water park place so they're all relatively close to the subway so it would be king station st andrew station 
Union Station. And we're opening our fourth location in December. Uh, we're going to announce the location in two weeks once we finalize everything. This location will be our first store where we're open on the weekends. We have tables. We it's, it's more of a sit down spot. Oh, excellent! Hope you hope to see you there on Sundays. Yeah. And then we're wrapping up a fifth location downtown as well, and that'll be more of a. Uh, that'll be that'll be more of a surprise, you can say. Okay. So let's uh, when that that's that'll be ready soon too. So we'll uh, we'll announce that one when when we're good to go. But yeah, I mean. Right now, Monday to Friday, if anyone's downtown, hasn't heard of it, please stop by. And then for the winter, we'll be open on the weekends. So we can come see you on Sundays and just sit there for four hours and do your thing. Yeah. No, great. Thanks so much, Armin. I really for sure. appreciate Thank your you. talk. And yeah, hope the audience got a lot of value out of it. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, thank you for listening to the podcast. I hope the story was inspiring to you. It Hopefully it also helped you expand your perspectives. Hopefully it also made you question the default path that you might have been going on or the default beliefs you might have had. And maybe now it'll make you even think about doing something about it, doing something different maybe, challenging yourself, being courageous. Who knows? But regardless, I'm really happy that you took some time out of your day to listen to this fantastic story with my guest. And if you would like to somehow, in some way, contribute and help support the podcast and maybe even just be part of the community that I'm trying to build with the greater OMD Ventures platform, really think about being a stakeholder in the platform. And the quick way to do that is to go to my website, oldmandan.com and go to the stakeholders page i believe it's oldmandan.com slash stakeholder and the link is also down below and that's how you can figure out how you can subscribe follow to get more updates on the free content but at the same time also donate and donate by actually just buying me a coffee that's just how i put it and you can buy me a coffee a month coffee a week or coffee every day of the year and think about it as the way that you know, if you wanted to chat with me, you might just bring me out for coffee and buy me a coffee. Or if you wanted to bring one of my guests out to chat, you might buy them a coffee. So I'm just think of it as I'm the service that's doing that for you. So you can just pay me in coffees. <laughs> Don't worry, uh, everything will still be free. It's just it would just really help if you would like to show your support this way, so that I can use the coffee money to buy myself actual coffees and also to buy my guests actual coffees at and use the leftover money to actually grow the platform as well as even keep it operationally alive as well because it all this is, isn't really free and it does take a lot of time to build it as well as operate it and hopefully grow it further. So your support would be amazing if you would like to contribute. And so yeah, just check out the website, go to the stakeholders page and read the different kind of benefits you might even get as a stakeholder. All right, thank you.